just need. I, I'm freaking out. Church, it's good to see you. Let's stand together as we worship this morning. Sing to the King who is coming to reign. Here we go.
Let's continue to worship in the Word. Let's stand together. We've got a new passage uh, for the month of February. And here's why I chose this one. Y'all, I'm wearying of hearing about what Vladimir Putin is doing on the Ukrainian border. I'm weary of us flexing our military muscles and saying, you do that, we're going to do this. I'm weary of the talking head saying, do we have enough? Are we going to be prepared? Are we going to be able to step in? And I I realize I want us to have a strong national defense. I do. We have had. We need to have. And it should be going forward. We need to have that. But as those who are in Christ, we're not going to boast in tanks and planes and bombs. Let's say this together. Psalm 27. Some boast in chariots, some in horses, but we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. Psalm 27. Isn't that good? We're going to boast in the name of the Lord our God. Now let's sing about it. Brother Tim, let's sing together.
join us this morning as we come together, as we bow before Jesus, that name which is above all names, the Alpha, the Omega. Let's bow before him. Father, I can't help but wonder from week to week as we gather in this place and we're at this part of the service. I wonder, what itch is this scratching? What box is this checking off? What need is this meeting? I don't know. There's so many that we could put on, on the list. frightening thing is that we keep gathering and we keep talking about the same challenges and problems. We gather and we sing and we pray and we go home and, and we wrestle with our despondency. We wrestle with our fears, our anxieties, our phobias. We wrestle with our inadequacies and insufficiencies. And yet we come and we pray and we sing and we go home. God, I, I hope that we're just, just not one on the list of possible prescriptions, possible helps. Go to church, maybe things will get better. If not, take a pill, maybe things will get better. Take a snort, at least maybe I'll forget for a little while. Do something different, go someplace different, try something exciting, maybe that'll distract for a little while. And we come and we sing and we pray and we go home. God, I, I pray that as we are here in this place, 
we're not just checking off one of those innocuous boxes, but Father, we're, we're here as your people, your children, and you've, you've drawn us out. It's your invitation, your prescription, and you're here. You've not sent one of your flunkies, you're here meeting us face to face. And as you peel it back, I mean, you know about our fears and inadequacies, our phobias and our anxieties. You, you know about all that stuff. You know what we did in the dark last night as well as what we're doing in the light today. You know all of that and, and you meet us here in this place bringing with you that that will change us, make us wiser and stronger and healthier and better equipped for what we don't know about tomorrow. You are able to do all of that as we are able to trust you and lean on you and look to you. I hope, I hope that's going to happen. I hope it's happening right now. And you will get the glory for it. We'll point to you and say, he did that. He did that and he's doing that. We're going to thank you for what you're up to. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand together.
we've gotten so accustomed to those annoying alerts that we hardly pay any attention. It's happened in here during church. All those phones going off at the same time, warning us about an amber alert in South Texas or a silver alert in some other part of the state, and we briefly glance and erase it and carry on. It's the same in the old days. We were sitting there with our black and white TVs, and that, that odd-looking symbol came on the screen and said, this is a test. This is a test of the emergency broadcast system. In the event of a real emergency, you would be instructed to, and then they would give you all the details. And it was just irritating because it would come at the most critical part of the show that you were trying to watch. Well, this was January 13th, four years ago. I remember reading about it in the news, but because I live here and not there, I didn't care about it a whole lot. But on January 13th, 2018, in the state of Hawaii, the emergency broadcast network came alive. And the message on their phones and on their televisions was this, ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. Now you're sitting around having your post toasties and your Fruit Loops, and you get that. What are you going to do with that one? It was a mistake. The operator on duty that morning had the responsibility of performing a test of the emergency broadcast system. They had a drop-down menu that had the messages that could be sent out. She missed the this is a test button and hit the one that said this is a live drill. It took them 38 minutes to figure out what had happened and to send out a message. 38 minutes of sheer what? I mean, are you afraid? Do you, where do you go? I mean, if there's a, an intercontinental ballistic missile headed your way that's equipped with a nuclear warhead, I mean, it's not like you can just throw up your umbrella and say, oh, I hope this protects us. I doubt many Hawaiians have missile bunkers in the backyard, though a few may have. What, what do you do? I, I don't know. I don't know. I would suspect that most just ignored it. Eh, whatever. I think that's where Peter found himself. He had those out there that were going, eh, whatever. Not a big deal. He'd been wrestling with that group out there that were tainting the teaching pool in the congregation, who were denying the truth of those things that he had shared with that congregation. And they were making them doubt some pretty critical things about their faith and their life in Christ. One of them being the reality of the return of Jesus Christ. And so as we come to the end of 2 Peter, and by the way, this is for this series, this is the end of 2 Peter. And next Sunday we're going to be moving on to something different. And, and so if you're weary of 2 Peter, this is your happy day. If you had not had enough yet, sorry, this is the end of it. And it's good that we are ending it because that's fundamentally what he says. Here's what the end is probably going to look like. 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 10, he said, But the day of the Lord, and that's the day, the end day, the climactic day, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. In which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to His promise, we're looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by Him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in some of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the, the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of the Scripture, to their own destruction. I wonder... We've been preaching 
teaching and singing about the second coming of Christ as long as Jesus has been gone. They started right after he ascended into heaven. The apostles were sharing that message, and I believe they preached that message with some pretty good conviction. Many believed, held on to their words, and were looking for, in that first century, the second coming of Christ. We've been preaching and teaching it ever since, and I wonder, and don't answer this question, don't raise your hand or nod your head or even look like you're listening to me, but I wonder, I wonder if among us, good Christian people who gather in churches on Sunday morning, I wonder if perhaps in the back of our minds we say, I don't know. Really? You'd think that if he's going to come, he'd have already come. I mean, it's been 2,000 years. Maybe he's not. See, that's what Peter was dealing with. That group of false teachers had come in and said, he's not coming. If he were coming, he'd have already come by now. Look at all the people who've died since you guys have been preaching this gobbledygook. I mean, this is what we got. This world is what we have. So eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we all may die. And they did. And, and the, the church fellowships were getting out of hand. I mean, they were getting plastered. They were enjoying libations and staggering around, singing hymns like they'd never sung them before. Uh, it, was, uh, it was worse than Aunt B and her, her ladies' aid group after they got a hold of Colonel Parker, Parker's tonic and got all liquored up that day. I mean, we, we could just have a large time. We could throw caution to the wind and say, have as much sex as you want to, enjoy as much life as you can, grab all the gusto you can because this is all we got. That's what they were preaching in the first century. In the first century, before they had a single beer commercial to assist them. First century. So Peter, and I think by this time, yeah, he's a little older, a little longer in the tooth, but he's not senile. He hadn't lost him, himself in that moment. He, he's just a bit grieved, but also challenged to get the truth back out there. And so here it is. I think he makes... Three statements about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Here's the first one. His coming will be clear, decisive, and unavoidable. He had just said that, you know, the Lord's being patient, and a thousand years is like a day, and a day is like a thousand years, so just hang your hat on that, whatever that means to you. Just know that, that the Lord's still at work, and He's going to come. Don't get all bothered about your watch or the calendar. But now he says, but, but the day of the Lord is going to come like a thief. That's a great word picture. We, we can all kind of wrap our minds around, oh, he's going to be like somebody that breaks in unexpectedly. Somebody that doesn't call for an appointment. They just show up, usually under the cover of darkness, but sometimes they case the joint and realize that you leave at 8 in the morning and don't get back till 5 in the afternoon. So they've got all those hours to break into your house, steal what you've got, and be gone before you get back. A thief. Going to surprise you. And Peter said, that's how the coming of the day of the Lord is going to be. Well, he didn't make that up. I mean, he didn't come up with that idea. He was merely repeating what he'd already heard. And I'll tell you, he was repeating what he'd heard from the Lord. We go to Matthew chapter 24, and there in the 42nd verse, Jesus himself said, therefore be on the alert. You, all of you, be on the alert, for you don't know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. The day of the Lord, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Peter wasn't trying to work out a millennial plan so that you could have it all figured out. Oh, there's the tribulation. There's the rapture. Oh, there's the thousand-year reign. Oh, there's... He didn't... He, he wasn't concerned about all of those details and, and, and wasn't wound up in giving us a plan that we could hang our hat upon. He just said, the coming of the day of the Lord will be like a thief breaking into your house. Jesus said the same thing. Paul picked up on the angst in the congregation. And there was a reason they, there was angst among them. There, there was a little bit of consternation among them because... I believe Paul was a great speaker, preacher, and had preached about the return of the Lord with such conviction that they believed that Jesus was going to come back in their lifetime, first century. Guess what happened? Some of the old people started dying. Mama died, Daddy died, Grandma died, Grandpa died. And they didn't know. They hadn't covered that in the Sunday school lesson yet. Where did they go? 
What happened to Grandma? Is she just lost out there somewhere in space? And so he said, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede. Some of your versions say prevent. We're not going to get in the way of those who have fallen asleep, died. That's a euphemism. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So let's answer that question. What about those who have died, who know the Lord, and we have buried them in the ground? What, what's going to happen to them? Are they lost forever? He didn't get into all the details. He just wanted to let them know they are not lost forever. Their physical bodies are going to be reunited with their soul, spirit, their intermediate state. They're going to be reunited and they're going to be caught up out of the grave, out of the ground, and, and be reconstituted in that moment. So that was the first answer. Oh, okay, well then they're good. What about us? What if we are hanging around at that time? Are we all going to have to die first and then be brought back to life? No, he said, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Can you use your imagination? Picture what that's going to look like. A shout. It's not going to be a heavenly... <clears throat> It's going to be an angelic, trumpeting voice. Hey! Probably it'll sound better than that. You know, more, more God-like. But it's going to be unmistakable. Around the world, the voice will have been heard. Dead in Christ are going to rise first. Those who are alive and remain are caught up in the air with them, and so shall we ever be. Y'all, I don't think on the evening news, local news, out of Shreveport, if that's where you get your news. Or out of Dallas, if you're lying, and that's where you get your news. Wherever you, wherever you get your news, I don't think that the, the local talking heads are going to say, we're not sure what happened, but something happened in our community today. The big guys on the evening news at 6 o'clock, CBS, NBC, ABC, they're not going to get on there and say, uh, there are some things that we can't explain today. We're, we're not sure. There's been some unusual activity in a few cemeteries around the country, and we're going to be following up on that. I, I believe that that evening on the evening news, those who've been left behind are going to be able to say with clarity, you know what, those nutty Christians have been talking about this for centuries, and y'all, I think it happened. And certainly it did happen, and it's going to happen. And Peter was simply, I think, first of all, wanting to say to those who were denying the second coming and those who were in a quandary about whether to believe or not, he wanted them to know, y'all, it is going to happen and it is going to be unmistakably clear. We and they are going to know what happens. Number two, it is going to be decisive. This is not going to be the first in a wave of events that are going to bring human history to this climactic moment. It's going to be a decisive moment that has been looked forward to and pointed to in Scripture. And three, it's going to be unavoidable. You're not going to be able to observe this and say, can I pass? I don't think I'm quite ready for this yet. If, can you give me a week? Give me, how about a month? I'll take whatever you'll give me. Uh -uh. No, it's, it's there and it's going on. Clear, decisive, unavoidable. And then he takes a little detour, takes a little turn, and the mood gets a little bit darker, a little bit more morbid perhaps, but not really if, if you're standing on the right side of this. The second aspect of this coming revealed in this passage of Scripture is that his coming will be both revealing and vindicating. Two things at the same time, revealing and vindicating. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and, and then here's how it plays out, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. He restates it in verse 12, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. There are three little descriptors here that, that point to some things that are going to happen in that moment. Here's the first one. He said the the heavens are going to disappear with a roar. Well, what did Peter mean entirely by the word heavens? I don't know for sure. But, but I think he had to have been thinking about the, the heavens. They, they thought of a first heaven, a second heaven, a third heaven, layers of the atmosphere out there that ultimately uh, took us into the presence of the Lord. It's a part of the created order. 
And he said the heavens are going to disappear with a roar. That word is that word used to describe, one, the roar of running water. You've been out there on the rapids or on the creek or on the river where it was running pretty good and, and you just had this steady, steady roar as it washed over the rocks. But I think there's a more descriptive picture. And this morning I was helped uh, because I, I had remembered this and they were sitting in the room. Dr. Stewart and Celeste were sitting right over here. Years ago, we had a, a, an exceptionally harsh winter with some ice and it caused a lot of breakage on our trees. They had built the house out on Tankersley and had a lot of cedar trees around it. And I mean, they had been decimated by the freeze. So Dr. Stewart had uh, dutifully gathered up all the breakage and piled it up into a pile and readying for whatever was going to be next. Uh, well, what was next was in the springtime, Dr. Stewart and Celeste decided to invite the students, the youth ministry, to their house for a weenie roast. Now you see how high I am. The, the pile that he had collected was about as tall as I am standing on this platform. It had dried out by then, in several days, and so you got dry cedar limbs piled up in a pile. Well, Dr. Stewart didn't want to take any chances, and so he procured an accelerant. I'm just going to leave it at that. He procured an accelerant and doused the pile of dried cedar with the accelerant, went, thank God, and put that aside, and lit the match and cast it onto the pile. I was present. <laughs> it was a sound that I can't duplicate, but it was something like this. <gasps> and in that moment, the earth shook. <laughs> Flames shot into the heavens, I think into the presence of God. And all around were awed by it. It was an incredible explosion in that moment. You'd have thought a neighbor might have called the fire department. No, an individual on the other side of Lake Tankersley called the fire department. <laughs> they felt the concussive effect. They saw the flames and thought that several people must have died in that conflagration. And so in a few minutes at the youth weenie roast, the Mount Pleasant Fire Department showed up to wish us all well. I think... Peter had something like that in mind. There's going to be this unmistakable conflagration of the atmosphere, and it's going to be consumed and done away with in that moment. Hold on to that picture. He said, then the, the elements are going to be destroyed by fire. All the host of heaven will wear away, Isaiah said in Isaiah 34. Old Testament pointing to that day. And the sky will be rolled up like a scroll, John wrote in Revelation at the very end of the book. In verse 1 of chapter 21, he said, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away. They were gone. So the earth, the created order, not just the heavens, but the, the earth, this plane, will be consumed by a refining fire. And then there was one other descriptive phrase, And the earth and its works will be burned up. A variant translation is, The earth and its work will be laid bare. Well, fire does that sometimes. It, it destroys the cover and exposes what was beneath. That's the idea of this judgment. It, it's going to take away all the trappings of this world, all the things that we've deemed important, all the things that we placed value on and in, and they're going to be taken away in that singular moment, and everything is going to be exposed for what it really is. Everything revealed, God's judgment, thorough and complete. Y'all, I know. I'm standing up here and I'm your preacher, but I know how ridiculous this is sounding to some of you. How bizarre it sounds to some who don't come to church and might be listening to this service today just out of curiosity. They're going to go, you know, I thought Davis was, was level-headed. I thought he had good sense, but he's as nutty as the rest of them. I mean, does he actually believe that the heavens are going to be consumed with a roar? Does he believe that the earth, the elements are going to be consumed with fire? Does he believe that, that everything is going to be destroyed and then be remade? Does, does Davis believe that? Yes. Yes. Fair question. You can ask me, well, Clint, how can you believe that? We've come a long way. We've made so many scientific discoveries. We have... We, we found things that, that we believe have disproved the Bible. How can you hang on 
to those old ideas that make us seem so stupid to teenagers and children and young adults who are so with it. See, that's what I'm worried about. I'm worried about a generation that's so with it that they don't know Jesus. You can be with it and without him. I believe that the same God who in the beginning said, let there be, and there was, out of nothing he created everything that is. That same God has the power to judge the world and everything that's in it and make any part of it go away in an instant. And then, same God has the power to create a new heaven and a new earth and make everything new. Ooh, I'm telling you, there were heads spinning in those churches with those teachers, those false teachers. It was worse than that scene from The Exorcist where her, her head was spinning and she was spitting out green vomit. I'm telling you, they were doing everything but vomiting green stuff all over the rooms. They were going nuts. How can you say you believe that? You know, Peter didn't have it all figured out. He didn't have all the answers, as do none of us. All he could say was, you know what? I heard this from the very lips of Jesus himself. And I can only tell you what Jesus told me. So he said, I don't want to leave you there. I don't want to leave you hanging in the fire. Let me remind you of this. Third thing. His coming. The fact that we're looking forward to. That we are anticipating a day out there in the future. When Jesus is going to break into human history like a thief in the night. That, that reality for us shouldn't just be a fable, a myth, a legend. A story that picks us up on bad days and then gets us through when somebody we love dies. His coming is both encouraging and challenging. Encouraging. Peter wrote, since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be? What should we do with ourselves? How do we fill in the time between now and then? What sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Then in verse 14, therefore, beloved, since we look for these things, we're anticipating these things. Be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. You hear it? Clear instruction, clear direction here. In the meantime, in this in-between time, while we are impatiently waiting, looking forward to, longing for the Lord to return, live holy and godly lives. I think that's an important word for these days. Y'all hear the conversation. I mean, you hear the overly pious and the overly spiritual, and we all, I think, can be that way at times. I know I certainly can, and others can be as well. And we sit around and we bemoan the state of affairs of the day. Oh, the world, the world, the world, preacher, the world. It's getting worse and worse. Do you see the way these young people are dressing? Do you hear all these labels that we're affixing to ourselves? Oh, preacher, did you see that television show last night? I, it was so bad I had to watch every bit of it. Oh, pastor, did you hear the news this morning? I, oh, Lord, please come back. Well, that sounds very noble, doesn't it? Oh, bless their heart. They're so spiritual. No, they're not. No, they're not. They hadn't read the whole book. I'm as disturbed about some of this gobbledygook as you are. But when Peter spoke and Jesus spoke and Paul wrote, their instruction was, don't be like Chicken Little running into the dark crying, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. He said, I, I want you to live holy and godly lives. Show them that you got a little sense, people. Live like you know Jesus. Don't live like the world that, that runs at the first sign of trouble on, on every turn, but live like you've got some Jesus sense. Live holy and godly lives. And then secondly, live in peace. Live in peace. Again, you don't have to like it. Live in peace. How can we live in peace, preacher, when all this stuff's going on? Because you got Jesus, that's why. Because you got Jesus. We sang it, Jesus, only Jesus. If you're just going to sing those words at church and not believe it when you leave out of here, you're wasting your time and mine. Well, not mine. I get paid whether you're in with me or not for the time being. Live in peace, which, which means that as much as we know things are not right and, and we know he's coming again, let's just go ahead and live. Live for him in the meantime, and, and while we're living for him, don't be like those false teachers who said it doesn't matter. Eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow you die. You know, sleep around, drink around, drug around, cuss around. 
dress like a trollop. Behave as if you've got no sense. It doesn't matter because one day you're going to die and it'll all be over with and, and nobody cares at that point. And Peter said, whoa, whoa, whoa. It does matter. Because whether you die in Christ or he comes again, this isn't the end. There's an accounting. There's a judgment that's coming. And we want to be prepared to step into the presence of our Lord. And we don't, have to, we don't want to have to bring with us all this gobbledygook that we've accumulated because we thought it really didn't matter. This is not all there is. Jesus said, What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or another question, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Good question. Final observation, final perspective. I, we, often act as if we believe that this world is the permanent fixture. It's going to be here. In fact, some of the more optimistic secularists among us believe that we're on the cusp of getting all this figured out. The world is just it's almost there. We're about to fix everything that's broken, heal everything that's sick. We, in fact, we're not far from turning this globe into a virtual utopia. Now, I know you have trouble believing that this morning. We're not there, but we are so close. All we need is a little bit more government funding. Just, just a little more government money. We, we need, and may have to raise your taxes. That's just the way it works. If we're going to have all these government programs and pay for them, uh, money just doesn't you know, come out of thin air. We're going to have to raise your taxes. But just hang on, because what that means is your world is going to get better and better and better. The bigger the government gets, the better your world gets. Amen? Careful now. But there are those out there that are selling that snake oil. It's just going to get better and better. And one day, one day, God is going to be walking through heaven. He's going to look through the glass bottom part of heaven that he keeps closed most of the time. He's going to open up that glass bottom part of heaven and look down and say, would y'all come here? You are not going to believe. Look down there. You know, that thing was in a mess here 25, 30 years ago. Do you see what they've done with that? They've cleaned up the environment. They have straightened up the economy. They have reduced crime. They have made that such a wonderful place to live. Let's take a vote. I make a motion that we all pack up and leave this despicable slum called heaven and move down there to that wonderful place that they have created. Some of you are looking at me as if I have taken a lick to the head. But do you all listen to some of the rhetoric that we're hearing? Every single day, there are folks out there who are selling that snake oil and people are buying. As if this earth is the permanent part and we are the temporary ones. We're going to pass away, it'll all be over, but the world's going to be here. What Peter reminded us of in this verse is this earth that we're so bound to and so invested in, y'all, this earth is temporary. One day, she's going to be consumed and everything will be made new. You know what lasts? Not these temporary beings that we're looking at around here. We last. We last for all eternity. On one side will be those who are welcomed into the presence of the Lord in that place called heaven that He prepared for His children and His children only. New heaven, new earth, it's going to be a glorious and glad day. Others who refused Him, rejected Him, kept Him at, at arm's length and said, uh-uh, I don't believe that stuff you're selling they're also going to live eternally. I don't know how. I, I, I don't know how hot the fire is going to be, how high the flames are going to leap. I, I don't know the answer to all those questions. Here's what I do know with absolute certainty. Heaven is to be where Jesus is. Heaven is to be where Jesus is. Jesus is going to make it heaven. It's just going to be so, so good. Hell is going to be where Jesus isn't. You see, it really becomes immaterial how hot the fire is, how high the flames lick, and how great the suffering is going to be. You're trying to figure out if you want to make a calculated risk. You take Jesus out of the picture, out of the equation, and everything becomes hell. So that helped me a little bit. We've got this thing all upside down. The world is temporary. We are eternal. 
So we need to be prepared. Live ready. Okay? Heavenly Father, we're in the process of trying to make up our mind what we're going to do with this. Believe or not believe. Commit or not commit. And I know it's hard. Some of these things I've talked about this morning are so contradictory to stuff that we have heard or been taught in certain circles. And yet, here it is, right here in the, in the Bible. Old Testament confirmed it, Jesus spoke it, and the apostles took up the mantle and preached the truth. I pray, O oh God, that we will live with that perspective of truth, of hope, of eternity, of life, that makes a difference in the here and now and a life that has eternal implications. I pray, God, that you will draw us to yourself. And, and maybe even this morning there, there would be a him or a her sitting in the room who would say, yeah, Clint, yeah, God has shown me. I, I know now that that's truth. I need Jesus. I need to know without a doubt that I am ready. I am prepared for this life and the life to come. And so, Father, I pray these things in Jesus' powerful and precious name.